the people of India. Having solemnly resolved to constitute India into a sovereign, socialist, secular, democratic republic, give to ourselves this constitution. The preamble to the Constitution of India is something every school-going child knows by heart. 85 words that define the spirit of our democracy. Every word very carefully chosen by the nation's first law minister, Bhim Rao Ambedkar. He's the man who was the chief architect of our Constitution, also the Dalit icon who gave millions a voice against discrimination. But his story is much, much more than that. And it all begins really in this small school in Satara. Books in hand, nine-year-old Bhim walked into Maharaja Pratap Singh High School in the year 1900. But for the man who authored India's finest piece of writing, his baby steps in learning were a travesty. His first lesson was the existence of caste. Bhim was a Mahar, a caste of untouchables whose traditional duty was to dispose of dead cattle. Banished to the bottom of the Hindu society, their touch, their voice, even their shadow was seen to be polluting. Inside school, Brahmin teachers refused to teach little Bhim Rao. Some agreed but made him and his brother sit in a corner on gunny bags that they carried from home. The humiliation was endless. If the boys got thirsty, they had to wait for a peon to come in and pour water into their mouth because outcasts weren't allowed to touch either the water pot or the water inside it. And God forbid, if the peon was absent, then the boys would go thirsty the entire day without a single drop of water. Young Bhim responded in the best way he could. His sheer academic brilliance won him grudging admiration and a new surname. कहा जाता है कि इसी स्कूल में उनको अंबेडकर यह जो नाम है पहले अंबाउडेकर था इसी स्कूल के जो अध्यापक थे उन्होंने उन्हें अंबेडकर यह नाम इसी स्कूल में दिया. But a new surname didn't help. When Ambedkar's family moved to Bombay, the prestigious Elphinstone High School did admit young Bhim, but did not let him learn Sanskrit. The language of the ancient Vedas could not be polluted. He was forced to study Persian instead. Turn in any direction you like. Caste is the monster that crosses your path. You cannot have political reform. You cannot have economic reform unless you kill this monster. In 1907, Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar became the first person from his community to get a matriculation from the Elphinstone School. It was an uncommon achievement, but what followed, even more so. After getting a scholarship from the King of Baroda, he chose not to sail to England, as was the trend in those days, but to go instead to America for higher education. It was the land of equality, and liberty. Columbia University opened up a new world for Ambedkar, a world of books and of new ideas. A man of versatile intellect, he first obtained a doctorate in social sciences and then moved to London to study law and economics. Ambedkar would go on to author over 50 books. Caste was his favorite subject but he also wrote about economics, law, even a work that controversially supported partition. He was a legal brain, a constitutional brain, a top-class economist. He also wrote some important works in sociology of the caste system, the most well-qualified intellectually of any Indian politician of the 20th century, probably ever. Dr. Ambedkar, Maharaja is expecting you. Please. From England, Dr. Ambedkar returned to work for his benefactor, Saji Rao Gaikwar, who was the ruler of Baroda. Sir, I need a place to stay. You can't stay. Only to realize that all the degrees in the world 
couldn't get him a room to stay. At work too, he faced insults almost every day. Look here, you might be a senior officer, but you can't touch this water. You could see the shine on his face of intelligence with all that he came. But a small office, his co-people like, they may be simple clerks, they were high caste. They say that you can't take water from the same pot as we drink. But you know, if you see very carefully, the revolt comes first. There he says, no, I will drink water from the same pot. Dr. Ambedkar returned to Bombay in 1917, staying in a two-room chawl with his wife, Ramabai. The Swaraj movement was gaining strength, but Ambedkar wasn't impressed. The young non-conformist had a strong mind of his own. Writing in Muknayak, The Dumb Hero, a newspaper he started in 1920, Ambedkar says, A Swaraj, where no fundamental rights were guaranteed for the depressed, would be no Swaraj for them at all. It would be a new form of slavery. As India's freedom movement gathered momentum, Dr. Ambedkar began teaching political economy at Bombay's Sydenham College. Initially skeptical, even Brahmin students became lifelong disciples after listening to his lectures. This portrait, which hangs in the college today, is a testimony of his impact. In 1923, Dr. Ambedkar started his law practice at the Mumbai High Court. But the outcast lawyer found cases hard to come by in spite of his brilliance. For Ambedkar, it was now time to openly challenge the dark clouds of Hindu orthodoxy. He founded the Bahishkrit Hitakarni Sabha the same year to mobilize Dalits against their exploitation. Four years later, he did the unthinkable. At the time, this water tank at Mahar in Maharashtra could be used by everyone. Hindus, Muslims, even cattle, except the Bahishkrits, the outcasts. But now, the time for waiting was over. Bhim Rao led by acting himself. Self-respect, self-help, he thundered, leading scores of outcasts to the water tank. As he touched the water and drank it, the crowds followed. The impact of Dr. Ambedkar's act was revolutionary. 85 years later, his grandson Prakash repeats the same act at the same tank without a second thought. It is something that explains Ambedkar's legacy. It wasn't just about water, it was about humanity and equality. Untouchables had accepted caste system mentally and therefore since they had accepted his mental he said that mental slavery is first we should be attacked and then the physical slavery to get out of this mental slavery he said water which was being denied to a common man if i can pick it up and drink it then the other man and then the rest of the people will have a confidence in the whole thing and therefore he exercised the right in this uh, uh, right over here and lakhs of people followed him A day later, when priests carried out a purification ceremony at the water tank, Ambedkar was deeply hurt. Eight months later, he returned to Mahar, this time to ceremoniously burn the Manusmriti, a book he described as the Bible of slavery. Ambedkar's anti-caste movement rapidly gained momentum. Nasik's Kalaram temple was the next target. Ambedkar and his supporters laid siege at the temple gates in 1930 
demanding untouchables be allowed to enter. But Baba Sahib's temple entry movement was met with a lot of resistance that only fueled his disillusionment with Hinduism. Though I was born a Hindu, I solemnly assure you that I will not die as a Hindu. Twenty years later, he would fulfill his vow. Coming up, Baba Sahib's final break with Hinduism and his tussle with Mahatma Gandhi. Gandhi ji understood Ambedkar's pain. He understood Gandhi ji's agony, no doubt about it. I mean, he said, there in my film, that you are born untouchable, but I adopted myself as untouchable. Dr. Bhim Rao Ambedkar was now a voice India couldn't ignore. From within the freedom struggle, he was attempting to carve out a political relevance for the Dalits. For him, it was the only way to emancipate India's 16 million outcasts. Ambedkar's decision to accept an invitation to the Roundtable Conference in London greatly angered the Congress. The party called him a British stooge. And so, the stage was set for a confrontation between two champions of the downtrodden, Gandhi and Ambedkar. While their goal was similar, their method was somewhat different. Ambedkar was more radical, more confrontationist. He wanted to take the Dalits outside the Hindu fold. Gandhi thought that by abolishing untouchability, by giving Dalits greater political opportunities, Hinduism could be saved. But despite their differences, I think in retrospect, they should be seen as co-workers. The British announced the communal awards for Dalits in 1932, granting separate electorates and seat representation to minority communities. An upset Gandhi announced his resistance with a fast unto death at Pune's Yerwada jail. As the fast grew, Gandhi started losing in health. Everybody started requesting Dr. Ambedkar, and Dr. Ambedkar said, okay, I'll consider. And that is how the negotiations took place, and finally, the Pune Pact has come out in the whole thing. But in this, you will find Gandhiji understood Ambedkar's pain. He understood Gandhiji's agony, no doubt about it. I mean, he said, it is there in my film, that you are born untouchable, but I adopted myself as untouchable. At the stroke of the midnight hour, when the world sleeps, India will awake to life and freedom. On 15th August 1947, as India finally awoke to freedom, the earlier bitterness between the two stalwarts was now matched by maturity and wisdom. It was Gandhi who recommended Ambedkar's name as India's first law minister. As law minister, Dr. Ambedkar chaired the drafting committee whose onerous task was to give a complex India her constitution. The boy who was once refused admission in school because of his caste was destined to write India's Bible of Governance. Our difficulty, as I said, is not about the ultimate future. Our difficulty is how to make the heterogeneous mess that we have today take a decision in common and march in a cooperative way on that road which is bound to lead us to unity. On November 26, 1949, India got her constitution. A reflection of Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar's faith in democracy and social justice. Regarded as one of the finest in the world, it banned untouchability in India. Justice, liberty and equality became every Indian's 
fundamental right. The universality of his ideas were visible in other spheres as well. His politics was always inclusive. His policies were always inclusive. You can look at his uh, work in this labor government, interim government in 1942. For example, for minimum wages, he was asking for everybody. Uh, good life conditions, working conditions for lab laborers, he was asking for everybody. Maternity leave for women, he was asking for every woman, not simply for Dalit women. So I think his imagination is universal and politics is inclusive in character. <laughs> Dr. Ambedkar was getting old now, but the hunt for challenges continued. The violin was one such new passion. Baba Sahib, Delhi, when they came here in Bombay, they would send them a special gift to them. They would say, come here, come here, we have come here, we have to keep our education and continue. So, they would have so much fun, they would say to them. They would say, now our Guru Ji has come here, अब आपके लिए समय हम अभी नहीं देंगे उनका काम खत्म होने तक आपको बाहर बैठना होगा बाबा साहब बड़े सेंटिमेंटल थे उनके मन में क्या था पता नहीं है उनके मन में कुछ किसी ने बताया कि कुछ दुख था और वायलिन के जो सुर है वो उनको एक किस्म की तसल्ली देते थे द सैडनेस पर हैप्स केम फ्रॉम लूजिंग हिज वाइफ रमाबाई एंड फोर ऑफ हिज सन्स एट अ यंग एज In 1948, at the age of 57, Baba Sahib remarried. His wife, Dr. Sharda Kabir, was a Brahmin. The New York Times described the wedding as more significant than a commoner marrying into royalty. But Dr. Ambedkar wasn't done yet. He began drafting the Hindu Code Bill, aiming to grant women. greater legal rights in the country but his efforts to reorganize the framework of hindu society were short lived the bill aroused bitter controversy and was abandoned by prime minister nehru ambedkar quit the union cabinet in disgust in 1951 what he did next shook the very foundations of hinduism On 14th October 1956, Dr. Ambedkar reached the Diksha Bhumi in Nagpur, accompanied by his wife. With lakhs of supporters as witness, Baba Sahib renounced Hinduism to embrace the path of Buddha. Whole lakh of his followers converted with him that day. Two months later, Baba Sahib Ambedkar passed away at the age of 65. Five decades later, Baba Sahib Bhimrao Ambedkar's legacy. is more relevant than ever leaving an impact deeper than many imagined it's a testimony to why india counts him as one of its greatest ever <laughs>